good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Emmanuel United Church of Christ, where we have a passion for God and compassion for all. I want to start off this morning by saying, um, even though I've only been gone for 13 days, it literally felt like I've been gone for three months, like I was on another sabbatical. And I have really missed you all. And when I came to church this morning getting ready, it took me a little bit longer because I realized I wasn't really getting ready to come to church to preach, but getting ready to go to church because I myself needed to be in church. Amen. And I want to give thanks for Diane coming up and talking to me and setting the tone. The other thing is, talk about a major before and after. I am seeing faces right now that I have not seen for years. I am seeing new faces. I am seeing faces that have been on vacation for far too long, faces that have welcomed new life into their family. And you, there is literally double the amount of people here today than there was just two weeks ago. And it's also so wonderful to see how many of you look tan or refreshed or rejuvenated. So this is just an amazing first day back. Well, Tracy, maybe you're not so tan, but there's certainly a lot of light being thrown from your head. That's a good thing. So with that being said, as you can see, unfortunately, our beloved Carnid is not with us today. It turns out that as careful as she's been, unfortunately, she has come down with COVID. And also, she's been having very low potassium, and you know, as she's been working to lose that weight, she probably needs to add some more bananas and some <laughs> potassium-rich food into her diet. But we are so thankful that Simon is here, and Simon steps in every time we need. And it is amazing to watch Simon continue to literally grow before our eyes. I don't know, Simon, if you see the changes in you, but because we get to see you every few months, we have literally watched you go from being like a boy into a full-grown man. And it is just so exciting. And we want to surround Simon with our prayers as he gets ready to enter into college. And the reality that he also has to get a part-time job and he has to do school and work at the same time. But we know that you'll certainly be able to do that. We want to say happy anniversary this week to Art and Millie Freer. I forget how many years they've been married, but it is like way above 70. So we certainly want to celebrate that. We want to let people know that council is meeting this Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Our policy, nine, I'm sorry? Nine o'clock. Oh, nine o'clock. I had to get up an hour earlier. I just came back from vacation. <laughs> okay, so council is meeting at 9 o'clock on Wednesday, and it's our policy that anyone can attend council. So please know that you're all welcome to be there. Saturday, we are having our memorial service for Henry D'Angelo. We know that he did die a year ago, but because of COVID, we weren't able to have a celebration of his life. We are having one this Saturday, and I believe it's at 11 o'clock. Is that correct? At 11 o'clock, we'd love to see everyone there. So with that being said, you are now invited to silence your cell phones if you feel comfortable enough to do so. And all the stress and the worries and the news from the week before, now is the time to let that go and allow yourself to be present and to experience the resurrected Christ. And let us all stand as we join with our musicians as we enter into our time of sacred worship.
in the Lord, again we say rejoice. Let us praise and worship the Lord God's sanctuary. We are one in the body of Christ, sisters and brothers of the Lord. The Holy Spirit inspires the movement of all souls. Beloved, be pure and pleasing, praising God. We fix our eyes on Jesus, thankful for Emmanuel. Let's all sing now, Great is the Lord. to them a sign of welcome and grace. And let us now turn to our camera in the back and extend that same sign to those who are worshiping with us from home. And you may face forward. Christ is our advocate leading us to the light of righteousness, which means that no matter what tragic mistakes we have made, we can take them and lay them at the feet of Jesus. Let us now enter into a time of our own silent reflection and confession. Knowing that the God whose spirit moved over the waters of creation is the same God who forgives us, let us join together in saying, The Lord listens to our hearts, forgives our sins, and He shines upon us. We are surrounded by grace and not forgotten. You may, amen. And you may be seated. Let's say, Change my heart, O oh God. Oh, 
I realize I made a mistake. So before we hear the scripture, can we go back to our song of preparation? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Excellent. Why don't we stand as we say Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. like a refiner's fire and the, like the fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be swift to bear witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired workers and their wages, the widow and the orphan, against whom thrust aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. <clears throat> Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you in your tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. I will rebuke the locust for you so that it will not destroy the produce of your soil and your vine in the field shall not be barren, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will count you happy, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. May God add blessing to this reading of God's word. Amen. Please join with me in a moment of centering prayer. Gracious and holy one, thank you for being with us today. And thank you for always being by our side. We ask that your Holy Spirit continue to fill this place to guide my words and to open our hearts. It is in your Son's name we pray and we say, Amen. 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 So, the past few weeks, I have been busy reading a book. In preparation of our celebration of Women's Equality Day, Millie has given me a book called Mothers of Our Nation by Pokey Roberts. And it has felt like learning all about American history for the very first time. 
Maybe I wasn't really paying attention in school or maybe I'm reading about things they never taught us, but I really had no idea until I began reading this book just how difficult things really were for our American ancestors. I really had no idea what life was like leading to and during the Revolutionary War. Now this may sound foolish, but until I started reading this book, which is based on letters that women were writing during this period in history, I literally had no idea that if you were a woman living in America, you literally worked from sunup to sundown, and it didn't matter if you were a slave or a slave owner, if you were one of the poor or one of the very rich elites, and I had no idea that back then, every single woman was expected to have a child every two years. Could you imagine that? Every two years having to give birth? I had no idea, Millie, just how severe taxation really was. And I also had no idea until reading to this book about how many of our female American ancestors were literally figuratively giving the middle finger to Britain during this time through the actions they were doing. I had no idea that during the Revolutionary War there were literally teenagers who were left at home to run entire plantations and to watch over businesses. I had no idea that Martha Washington traveled beside her husband and was literally in the line of constant fire. Nor did I ever recall that during this time, to be a woman living during the Revolutionary War meant that you were constantly under the threat of rape, communicable diseases, and smallpox. Nor was I aware the large amount of homeless women and children and widows and orphans who were following our soldiers all around. Founding Mothers has become a very harrowing reading for me, and it's really caused me to wonder and to ask a lot of questions I never thought of before. First question is how? How in the world did these women do what they did back in the 1700s? Why? Why don't we know more about their stories and what they did? And of course, the other question is would. Would anyone today literally be willing to do what they were willing to do 300 years ago for the name of freedom? And then the final question is was. Reading this book made me really think was there ever a time in human history in which things really were easy? And was there ever a time in human history in which things truly were danger free? You know, we always hear people want to talk about the good old days, but did the good old days actually ever exist? In the 1980s, we had AIDS. In the 70s, we had Vietnam. In the 60s was all the protesting and the assassinations and segregation. In the 50s was Cold War and polio. And watching all those clips of school children having to hide underneath their desk, that doesn't sound like a good old day to me. And then in the 40s, we had an attempt to wipe out every single gypsy, Jew, and gay person out of Europe, not to mention in America, there were Jim Crow and lynchings, and there was prohibition, and there were internment camps. So exactly when were the good old days? How did those good old days, how long did those good old days actually last? And then who benefited from what is called the good old days? Because as reading the book Founding Mothers has made it very clear, the pursuit of freedom, and the pursuit of justice actually is non-stop. And it is actually something that is ongoing and persistent 
and it is made of people who are constantly unafraid to be brave and to be bold. But now there's the other question, the theological question that needs to be asked. Where? Where was God during this entire time? And where is God? Amidst all of these world events, where has God been? When the atomic bombs were dropped, when people in Africa were forced into slavery, when women had to set fire to their family farm to make sure the enemy couldn't get it, where was God? Where was God? That is a question that is as old as creation itself. And where is God is basically the question that is being asked in today's reading. Today's reading, you have to picture this being in a heavenly courtroom. <clears throat> and to fully understand what's going on in today's reading is to know that Malachi is writing about 75 years after Haggai had the people rebuild the temple. So as we're reading this, the exile has been over for 200 years. People have finally been able to return to Judah and to the temple after being away. It's been about 200 years. The temple is up and running again. Judah has reclaimed its place as a legitimate country. They have their kings, they have their commandments, they have their laws. The Sabbath rituals are back in place, but, but even though the people are back and they're back at worship, things just haven't felt the same ever since. I wonder how many people can relate to that. Even though the people are back and things are up and running, things just have not felt the same ever since. And what's happening in today's reading is the people of Judah are feeling very abandoned by God. And so they are theologically, spiritually taking God to court. And the charge they're pressing against God is you are absent. And we want to know where you are. Well, what we find out by reading this book is that Judah's priests have unfortunately re they have resumed their corrupt ways. And Judah's priests are acting like what they're doing, there's nothing wrong. And then we have people who have stopped offering God their very best. They're giving to God less than what God has asked for. And they're giving God the leftovers and the trash that they themselves no longer want. And in doing so, this is making God feel very weary. It's making God feel very tired. And it's making God feel like I've been holding my end of the covenant, but why should I care when my own people don't want to hold up their end of the covenant as well? And then when you read chapter 3, you discover what's really going on. You have these people who are abusing their spouses, who are doing the most unjust things, who are engaging in acts of violence against one another, who are coming to worship and they're coming up to the altar with crocodile tears in their eyes. The nation has become absolutely polluted with people who are refusing to pay their employees a fair wage. We have issues of children being oppressed and we have a nation that is ignoring their immigrants. Again, this is all in chapter 3. And the nation of Judah ends up taking God to court. And they ask God about the good old days. And basically, this is a group of people who want to make Judah great again. And so they put all the blame on God. And they say to God, where were you? Where are you? And why don't you love us anymore? And God's response to them is so powerful. God says to them in this courtroom, ever since I've known you, all I've ever wanted to do was to love you and to have you love me in return. God says to them, 
I have always been here. Return to me, and when you return to me, things will be really great. Return to me so that I can love you the way I've always wanted to love you. And this intrigues the people. So they say to God, how shall we return? And what is so interesting here is God's response is totally different than Micah. Remember in Micah, God says, I don't want your offerings. I don't want your bulls and I don't want your gold and your oil. I want you to do justice, kindness, and humility. God's response today is so completely different. And I think the reason why it's so completely different is that God is speaking to a different group of people during a different time and I think God has realized that the only way for the people to listen is for God to speak in a language that they understand. So God today speaks to them in terms of capitalism. God says, stop holding back your offerings. Give to me what you know you should. Stop giving me your third or your fourth rate stuff. To a nation that has spent the past 200 years trying to do things their way for their own benefit, we come to a point in which God has now given them a challenge. And God says, give to me what you know you should have been giving all along. And, and here's the great part. God says, give to me what you know you should have been given and watch how I will give back to you and watch how the heavens will open up upon you and rain down upon you gift after gift after heavenly gift. This is a story in which God says, all I want to do is love you and all I want to do is bless you. And this is all you need to do at this moment in time. You know, Carol, I think about the message you gave a few weeks ago in which you said studies are now showing us that the best medicine in the world is acts of justice and acts of kindness and acts of humility. And I think about the Reverend, v Reverend, the venerable Reverend David Astor as a Buddhist monk who has been teaching us for years that is their belief that generosity is the first step and out of generosity, everything else flows. Malachi, which is the closing final book of the Old Testament, has God saying, bring to me your full offering and watch just how happy you will be. The people of fifth century Judah can't figure out where the good old days have gone. And God's response is basically, the good old days are yet to be. The people wonder where God is, and God says, I've been here the whole time. I've just been waiting for you. The people of Judah wonder why God doesn't love them, and God says, I have always loved you, even when your actions have shown that you have taken my love for granted. The God of Malachi is a God who is present, who hears, who loves, and a God who wants to love in return. The God of Malachi is a God who endures the harshest of words and accusations, who takes note of the people's needs and concerns. And we see a God who listens. And God tells them that there will be healing in their wings and that they shall leap like horses who have been freed from their stalls. God says, if you want to live in the good old days, the choice is yours, but the good old days are not what you thought were in the past, but the good old days are actually the days that are yet to be. This message of Malachi, I think, is so amazing because it's both a challenge to us, but it's also a promise. The message of Malachi it's a challenge, but it is also a promise. The message of Malachi is deeply meaningful 
and yet it is oh so simple. The message is a message of what are we willing to do if we want to experience true happiness? The message of Malachi ultimately is that God has not forsaken us and God has not deserted us, but God is right here and God is literally ready, willing, and able to bless us again and again and again. And for that, I believe we can say, Amen. 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 With the promise and the challenge that God has placed before us, let us enter into our own time of silent reflection. Holy One, is it true that you have really been here the entire time? Is it true that you never forget us and that you never forsake us? And is it true that you are always ready to love us and to bless us beyond our own imagination? We ask, Holy One, that you continue to speak to us in the place we are and you continue to remind us of what it means to be children of heaven. We come before you, Holy One, mindful of the church in Fort Lauderdale and for their grief regarding their pastor, Reverend Patrick Rogers. We lift up Carneed in our prayers during this time. And we are mindful of the upcoming elections for the events that have taken place in Cuba and for the people who have died in Cuba and in Kentucky. Holy One, we give thanks for those who have returned and for being able to see familiar faces that we have not seen for a while. We give thanks for Reverend Kuyper being here and asking that you continue to surround him with what it is that he so seeks and desires. We give thanks for Simon and the ability to watch him mature in front of us. And we give thanks in advance for the work that council will be doing on Wednesday, knowing that the decisions we'll be making are decisions that are thought out and guided by you. We give you thanks for your love and for your mercy. And in advance, we celebrate the gifts of heaven that you are willing and able to rain down upon us. It is in your son's name we pray and we say, Amen. Amen.
Well, this is the part of the service we call invitation to offering. I'm going to give you a speaking of invitations. Uh, our hospitality group has, over the years, had special projects as they take on financing, things like the new carpet, uh, the steeple, many other things. Now it seems that we need to have some irrigation stuff for better. I don't know what else to call it. Stuff that needs to be replaced. So uh, beginning now, our hospitality events are going to um, contribute to that, to that fund. I think the best way for me to invite you to the offering is just to pray about it. So join me in prayer. Loving God, we are so thankful that you are in our presence, that you have blessed us in so many ways and continue to bless us. We pray now that you would bless these gifts, these gifts that are a portion of what you have given us. And so, are they gifts? Or are we returning to you what is rightfully yours? It is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we make this prayer. Amen. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? Angels may be glad. Let's sing while we get help. Oh, oh. 
fellowship Jesus shared with others. At this table, we We remember who Jesus fellowshiped with, <coughs> friends and the Lord, leaders and the everyday person, those who believed and those who judged, those with questions, he ate with those on mountaintops, by the sea, at weddings, and in people's homes. He even ate with the very one who would betray him. We will look upon this table, mindful of the life and death of Jesus Christ, reminded that he was willing to die for the kingdom of heaven, giving us to become a We recall that on his final night, Jesus ate with his followers, and that when God raised Jesus up, he ate with them by the shore and within the walls of the upper room. We are united before the table, aware of Jesus' faithfulness to God, even when he led to the cross and was celebrated by Jesus Christ, justifying his words in the ministry. We rejoice in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, who continues to gather and restore us. you to come forward and Diane if you would like to assist as well. We're going to have you do the elements as we recall the words of Corinthians. You want to go ahead and stand right here? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul wrote to one of the very first churches. And he says, I have received from the Lord what I now pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was to be betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. And after giving thanks to God, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then, in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you gather in remembrance of me. For every time we eat the bread or drink from the cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Let us go ahead and consecrate the bread and the juice. Gracious and Holy One, we ask that as we receive this consecrated grain of the field and fruit of the vine, that your Holy Spirit may unite us that we continue to feel the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ. Consecrate these elements as you also consecrate our hearts. Amen. Amen. 
I'd like to ask our ushers to please come forward. This is a reminder that we are still in COVID and we are still coming out. This is the body. And this is the body of Christ. May you go and serve to all who are present. participate in the body of Christ. Take and eat, for this is the body of Christ which has been broken just for you.
cup of the new covenant that we experience the gifts of eternal life. Take and drink, for this is the blood of Christ, which has been shed just for you. Having received the bounty of heaven's gifts, let us join together in our words of thanksgiving. We thank you, gracious God, for the gifts we have received at your table. May your generosity inspire us to live out the fullness of your promises. Amen. Thank you everyone for being present today and for being part of today's worship service. I want to remind everyone that council is meeting Wednesday at 9 a.m. and everyone is welcome to attend. Saturday at 11 we have a very special memorial service for a very special man, Harry D'Angelo, and everyone is welcome to attend. Again, we want to say thank you for Simon for filling in. And we would say to Carnid at home, get well soon, eat your bananas, and just get that rest that you need. Now I like to, Reverend Kuyper, yes. I don't think you all know what happened here this morning for me. I haven't been here for three months because I went through 24 cancer radiation treatments. I'm now being treated for my legs. I had somebody study me the whole time during the service when I had to stand because I want to fall forward. But I realized that when I stood there and I lifted the bread and I lifted the cup, I was stable. I didn't have to grab anything because God was holding me. I love watching you on my computer. And the craziest thing is every Sunday I think, well, what will he be wearing this Sunday? <laughs> Amen. Thank you for your testimony. I feel comfortable enough to do that. So I'm going to ask you to stand for the benediction. And I feel like any healthy church continues to evolve. And I'm gonna try something out that I haven't prepared, but I think we're moving into a place where we can be a Micah church and a Malachi church at the same time. So we're gonna to try to see what a benediction would sound like when you do something like that. So I'm gonna ask you to extend your arms so you're able to bless us as we bless you. 
as we prepare to leave this holy space and to leave this holy time, may we be unafraid to give the Lord our best, knowing that God is waiting to shower us with a multitude of heaven's gifts. And as recipients of those gifts, may we use them to find our own ways to do justice, to love kindness, and to continue walking as humbly as we possibly can. May we go in glory, and may we go in love. And may everyone say, Amen. Amen. Let's sing our awesome gospel.